uh, rapidly aging population that is going to have tremendous medical needs in coming decades and a lot of those needs can be addressed by transplantation and tissue replacement uh, especially of bioengineered tissues and uh, the ability to uh, inventory those tissues using uh, good preservation methods will be vital to treating uh, an aging population. Of paramount importance to the success of cryobiology is the ability to cool to super low temperatures without damage to cells. Normal freezing causes water to damage surrounding cells. This has a devastating effect since our bodies are 60% water. Enter a process called vitrification. Vitrification is a process where we replace uh, so much water inside cells and tissues with agents called cryoprotectants that we can cool the tissue or organs to a very low temperature, even as cold as liquid nitrogen, without forming any ice inside them. And in this process, once we become colder than about minus 120 degrees Celsius, the tissue becomes essentially solid like a glass. This photograph shows two rabbit kidneys at a temperature of minus 140 degrees Celsius. The kidney on the left was frozen and it's essentially turned into a, uh, an ice ball, severely damaged by ice, whereas the kidney on the right was protected by chemicals that caused it to vitrify rather than freeze and it shows no signs of ice damage whatsoever. As research gets closer and closer to perfecting cryoprotectants, the odds of successfully reversing the process get better. Until that time, what about damage that results from imperfect methods, especially for those who were cryopreserved before the advent of today's new cryoprotectants? Disease and ill health are caused largely by damage at the molecular and the cellular level. Today's surgical tools are simply too big to deal with that kind of damage. In the future, with nanotechnology, we'll have medical tools and medical instruments that are molecular in their size and in their precision. And these tools will be able to deal directly with the fundamental causes of damage and ill health. We'll be able to cure and heal in cases that today would be considered hopeless. Nanotechnology is the revolutionary concept of molecular-sized machines. Machines so tiny they could be introduced into a person. From the imaginations of artists around the world, we are able to see how nanorobots and nanomachines yet to be developed could solve any number of problems. From repairing aging cells to hunting down cancer. So if you had medical nano devices small enough that they could literally circulate through the body and literally enter individual cells these small devices with small onboard computers could check for several different conditions they could check the concentration of several different chemicals in the red blood cell they could check the location obviously if you're looking at liver cancer you don't have to worry about tissue that's in your big toe so location information could be used, chemical concentration information could be used so that the medical nano device would be able to identify the cell as either normal or cancerous. And if it was cancerous, then it could go ahead and use a variety of techniques to remove that cell, to eliminate that cell from the body. At prestigious research facilities like Stanford, Caltech, and MIT, advances in medical nanotechnology are being made. With each new advancement, the ability to revitalize patients in cryonic suspension moves one step closer to reality. Everyone always wants to know how long it will be before these technologies are available. And the correct scientific answer is, I don't know. Having said that, though, I can look at the trends in computer hardware, where every year we are building smaller, more precise, finer structures. And if you extrapolate those trend lines out, you find that within a few decades, we'll have to develop some sort of nanotechnology to keep the computer hardware revolution on track. And the technologies we develop that will let us build these molecular structures for electronic and computer devices should be applicable to let us build a whole range of other molecular structures. So I think a few decades in order to have 
the molecular machines, the molecular devices that we'll be using in nanomedicine. The promise of cryonics, vitrification, and nanotechnology is enormous. But these leading-edge sciences and technologies are not without their challenges, including sorting scientific facts from popular and wide-held fiction. The challenge is, is having the public understand the long-term implications and benefits to humankind of cryogenics, vitrification, and cryopreservation. Uh, right now, I think they get that Hollywood view of Ricardo Montalban in Star Trek coming out of a glass encased uh, a facility, uh, fully clothed, having been preserved for 200 years, and he starts walking and talking, or worse, they look at Austin Powers coming out of a vitrification or cryogenic preservation, and, and of course, that's, that's probably the worst side of it. But, but the fact of the matter is we need to explain to them and educate to them the long-term value of the scientific study of cryogenics, nanotechnology, and vitrification and the other related sciences and what it can mean long term to humankind. In any discussion of death and dying, the questions of God and religion often arise. Uh, I think the biggest myth about cryonics is that we're trying to play God, that we are tampering with the natural forces of life. Um, no, we're not trying to play God, and many of us have a belief in a supreme being. Um, that second part of it is a little more intriguing, that we're, uh, we're tampering with nature. Of course we are. That's what science does. It attempts to overcome those forces of nature that have been detrimental to the human species. Um, and we're proud of that. But are we playing God? Do we choose who shall live and who shall die? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And the philosophical questions abound. At each juncture of exponential advancement in science and technology, each time we push forward the boundaries of man's reach, it is inevitable that we take a good, hard look at what it means. This is radically new. This is radically different from what people have practiced for thousands of years. There is a lot of apprehension about where we're going with this technology, just like there's a lot of apprehension about where scientists are going with stem cell research, uh, with therapeutic cloning, uh, with cellular regeneration. These are all emerging sciences that are not going to stop just because it makes people queasy. Uh, these things are going to happen, and we need, as a society, to embrace these technologies. It is in our nature to explore, to seek, to question both scientifically and philosophically. And we will continue to question, to challenge the thresholds of science, to dream of tomorrow. You know, I lost my mother when I was 20 and she was 49. And I have to tell you, there's so many parts of my life that she didn't get to experience. I want to experience all of those times with my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. And I don't know what's going to happen to me. You never know. My mother was a healthy person, and then one day she was sick and she was gone. And that could happen to me. I would love the opportunity to suspend my life, to not suffer through illness and pain, and then to be reanimated at a time when I could be a healthy person again and live a healthy life. To dream of the unknown, unbounded, limitless. If you would like to order a copy of this program, visit us on our website or call this number.